Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. Last week, we talked about how the new rules have changed the game. And this week, <laughs> we'll see the first example of another new rule, Tom. Pat, that'd be that Pittsburgh-Denver game. That's the first regular season sudden death game in NFL history. And despite 15 minutes of sudden death play, it still ended in a 35-35 tie. Really a great game. It sure was. That's probably the biggest story of the week. But there are lots of other big stories. And we'll be showing you, like Miami's victory over Buffalo and New England's victory over the New York Giants. Gosh, two weeks ago, not too many people, including us, would have picked uh, the New England Patriots as the only 2-0 team in the AFC. We didn't predict that, did we? We may be able to go back and predict it now, huh? We'll be right back with This Week in the NFL after this message. Two weeks ago, the Miami Dolphins were soundly whipped by the Patriots, and last week everyone expected them to really explode on the Bills in retaliation. Instead, though, the Dolphins once again were in for a tough struggle looking like something less than two-time world champions. With number 22, Eugene Mercury Morris back in the lineup after missing opening day, the Miami Dolphins expected to return to their Olympian heights. But the Blue Mountain Mercury tried to scale proved a tough match, and the swift one ended up flat on his back. Then while the Buffalo Buffalo walked all over a dolphin effigy, Mercury in returning to the huddle ended up flat on his front. The shaking up was only temporary though, and after a short departure, Mr. Morris would return. <laughs> Meanwhile, his Buffalo counterpart, O.J. Simpson, was running beautifully, but carrying poorly. Luckily, number 27, Ahmad Rashad, covered for O.J., and the home team garnered seven anyway. Another Buffalo bright spot was the improved passing of number 12, Joe Ferguson, who hit J.D. E. Hill in the end zone for another Bills score. For the second week in a row, the Dolphins were less than impressive making uncharacteristic mental and physical miscues like this Mercury Morris fumble with alarming frequency. While the Dolphins stumbled and fumbled, so did the Bills, as the usually reliable O.J. squirted the ball loose as much in this game as he usually does in a season. O.J.'s mistake proved costly when Bob Greasy was able to fire the ball to number 88, Jim Mandich, who looted a cleverly disguised Buffalo defender for the touchdown. Greasy continued to move his team in close and then popped short passes into the end zone. This one to number 80, Marv Fleming, put the Dolphins on top to stay. Then Mercury Mountain Climber Morris found an easier route over and threw the Bills to wrap up the Miami victory 24 to 16. And finally, the world champs looked like world champs. Sounds like Abe Gibron's Chicago Bears got a little out of control last Sunday, Pat. At one point in the game, the Bears rolled up three consecutive 15-yard penalties. Unsportsmanlike conduct. It was a heated game, Tom, but in my mind, the bravest man on the field was the referee that walked off those 45 yards in penalties. 
It was a cold, wet day in Chicago, but it didn't seem to slow up Joe Namath, who went three for four in his first possession, including this perfectly placed 30-yarder to number 88, Rich Castor, which put the Jets out front 7-0. But it's not only Joe's arm that makes him great, because you just never know where he's going to throw the ball. Joe's eye deception routine paid off on this big gainer to number 44, fullback John Riggins, who carries down to the Chicago 24-yard line where a blindside tackle uncorked the football. But Riggins' fumble was a New York windfall as number 43, rookie Clarence Jackson, scooped up the football to complete a rather bizarre 58-yard scoring play. The Jets lead 13 to nothing. Joe Willie was hot last Sunday, and on this second quarter 77-yard drive, Joe looked to number 83, Jerome Barkham, to finesse the Jets downfield. At the 18-yard line, Joe called on number 44, John Riggins, who set up a three-yard Emerson Boozer touchdown, which made it 20 to zip the New York Jets. But just before the lopsided first half ended, number 19, Gary Huff, lobbed a pass to number 83, Charles Wade, that could have been taken as a sooth sign of what was to come. Sure enough, at the start of the second half, Gary Huff and his Bears were on the Jet 11-yard line, where Carl Garrett made a one-arm stab that put Chicago on the scoreboard. On their next possession, Huff and company were back for more, and number 26, Carl Garrett, was showing the way. Second-year man Gary Huff concluded the 51-yard drive with a highly poised checkoff pass to number 86, tight end Bob Parsons. That moved the Bears to within six points of the Jets, 20 to 14. But in the fourth period, when Chicago's threat was at its peak, Joe Namath coolly responded with a 59-yard drive, which Bobby Howfield concluded with a field goal that would prove decisive in the game's outcome. Where Chicago responded with an extemporaneous 28-yard pickup by number 17, Ike Hill. And although they succeeded in scoring on this drive by game's end, the infuriated Bears found themselves victimized by Joe Namath's charisma, a man whose presence is good for two points any old time. Two weeks ago, after the opening day dust had settled, the New England Patriots stood alone in the limelight for their stunning upset of the world champion Miami Dolphins. But though the victory was impressive, it failed to change almost anybody's opinion of Chuck Fairbanks' Patriots. And last week, when New England traveled to New Haven to face the New York Giants in the Yale Bowl, the Patriots were once again the underdogs. Compared with most of the piston-leg running backs in the NFL, Mac Heron looks more like a spark plug. And what you see is what the Patriots get from this little Mack truck, for it's Heron's heroics that sparked the New England Patriots. But before Mighty Mac ever got his hands on the football, Norm Snead had driven the New York Giants eight plays to this touchdown by Ron Johnson. Midway through the first period, Jim Plunkett finished a six-play TD drive, hitting who else but Mighty Mac to tie the score at seven. Employing a short passing ball control attack, Norm Sneed set up a two-yard touchdown plunge by Joe Dawkins, giving New York a 14-7 advantage at the top of the second quarter. But on the following kickoff, Mighty Mac again sparked the Patriots' attack. 
bouncing upfield and gaining on one play most of what the Giants had required 15 plays to accomplish on the previous series. Aaron's 62-yard gallop put New England in business on the Giants' 38. And on the next play, Jim Plunkett reached long to Randy Vataha in the end zone, and the score was now tied 14-all. Then the Giants, who had moved the ball consistently, faced a stiffening New England defense. Still, Sneed managed to construct a seven-minute, 14-play drive deep into Patriot territory. But on six thrusts from inside the five, New York was denied. And the half ended with a score, 14-14. Beginning the second half, Norm Sneed was harassed by an aggressive Patriot defense which sacked him twice as the Giants' offense faltered. But neither could the Patriots sustain an offense until sparked by a 20-yard punt return by Mac Heron. And Jim Plunkett capitalized with his pass to Sam Bam Cunningham, making the score Patriots 21, Giants 14. The top of the fourth quarter, Plunkett engineered a long drive. The key play in this attack was an 18-yard pop by Mighty Mac. And after 14 plays, Mac Curran stepped around right in, bringing the Patriots advantage to 28 to 14. For the Giants, there was a ray of hope remaining when their Canadian import, Leon X-Ray McQuay, fled 72 yards upfield, putting the Giants quickly in scoring position. Norm Sneed took advantage of the opportunity, hitting Ron Johnson five plays later for the score. But a muffed extra point attempt left New York still two scores behind. And the Patriots held for their second upset victory of the season, winning 28 to 20. Last year, teams stacked up their defenses at the line of scrimmage and ganged up on John Brockington and MacArthur Lane. The Packers only bona fide offensive weapons, Tom. That's right, Pat. This year, the Pack was supposed to open up things on offense. But last week against the young Baltimore Colts, Green Bay stuck to their Neanderthal style of football. In week number one, Green Bay collapsed before a veteran Viking defense. But on Sunday, they met a callow Colt team comprised mainly of first and second year players. Forty-three times, John Brockington, number 42, and MacArthur Lane, number 36, tested the Colts on the ground. And all they got for their troubles was a ton of bruises and a paltry 84 yards rushing. While Baltimore's front four manhandled Brockington and Lane, the Packers' superb pass defense throttled Colt quarterback Marty Domry. Dumrays was intercepted four times by the alert Packers, and this one by safety Jim Hill, number 39, broke open a 3-3 tie in the second quarter. Hill's heads-up play set up an easy one-yard touchdown by MacArthur Lane. Quarterback Jerry Taggy relied on short passes that sent back circling over the middle to clear out the sidelines for the wide receivers. The pack ran up a comfortable 20 to six pad on Lane's second touchdown, a 13 yard burst through the heart of the Colt defense. With time dying, Baltimore switched to the spring loaded right arm of second year quarterback, Burt Jones. 
Next to Joe Gilliam of the Steelers, Jones has the hottest young gun in the NFL. But he is far behind Jefferson Street Joe in reading defenses, and often he just packs it up and runs for his life. Taking a page from John Unitas' playbook, Jones broke out the old flea flicker play. A pass interference call set up Baltimore nicely inside the Packer 10. From there, Jones threw the setback Bill Olds for the Colts' only touchdown of the game. Although the Packers dealt Baltimore their second straight loss, 20 to 13, it'll be an uphill fight for Green Bay and the NFC Central unless they find some lightning in their offense. Green Bay and Baltimore used to fight it out every year for the championship of the NFL's Old Western Conference. In recent years, Green Bay has had their problems with Minnesota, but not nearly as many problems as Detroit has had. Last week in Detroit, the Vikings were trying for their 13th straight win over the Lions. It was a perfect day for football in Detroit. And as always, before the game, the two teams practiced the skills they would need to win. For the Lions, drills and fumble recovering might be the key to an upset over the long-standing nemesis Vikings. And on the opening kickoff, their practice paid off. Detroit recovered two Viking fumbles and even blocked a punt in Minnesota territory. Despite this rare display of generosity by the Vikings, the Minnesota defense had little difficulty with Detroit's decidedly conservative offense. Aldi Taylor, into the line. Followed by Steve Owens, into the line. On third down, the Vikings waited for Bill Munson to pass. Into the flat. It was an entirely frustrating experience for the Detroit offense, and in particular for quarterback Bill Munson, who at times looked like a man with a problem to which there is no solution. offense appeared inept to many observers, much of the credit for no Detroit touchdowns must go to the Minnesota defense, still a veritable purple pulverizer of opponents' passers. When he had to, Fran Targenton moved the Viking offense with passes to super smooth John Gilliam. The game's only touchdown came about on a ridiculously easy maneuver by Chuck Foreman. And for Minnesota, it was a 7-6 victory and 13 straight over the Lions. For Detroit and its fans, there was only one thing left to do. Pat, here we are coming up to the third week of the season, and who would ever have thought that the St. Louis Cardinals would be the only unbeaten team in the NFC East? I would have never thought so, Tom, but strangely enough, they've been doing it on defense. They were supposed to be an offensive team, but so far, defense has done the work. Last year, when the St. Louis Cardinals hired Don Coriel, he promised a wide-open offense, and he delivered. This year, Coriel's talking defense, and if you ask the Washington Redskins, they'll tell you what the man says is what the man gets. In their matchup last Sunday, the Cardinals showed to be a two-fisted crew. A lot of their wallop came from 6'5 defensive end Ron Jankowski, number 78. In 
the first quarter, the defense, aided by Blitzy, number 59, Pete Barnes, came up with the play of the day. Number 78, Ron Yankowski, fielded the ball, and with number 74, Council Rudolph, in escort, sprinted 71 yards to a lineman's dream and a 7-3 Cardinal advantage. And while the defense's score was an outgrowth of opportunity meeting preparation, Charlie Taylor's drop of this Billy Kilmer aerial had something more to do with divine intervention as the Cardinals clung to their three-point lead. Three plays later, however, Jim Hart pitched out to number 21, Terry Metcalf, who upstaged even Yankowski on this 75-yard romp which put the Cardinals up 14 to three. But on the following series, Billy Kilmer drove his team back into contention. Nine times calling on number 47, Dwayne Thomas, who responded well to his first start since 1971. Then from the 11-yard line, Billy Kilmer executed a reverse rollout that ended with a TD flip. The number 88, Alvin Reed, which put the skins within easy striking distance at 14 to 10. With the emergence of the Redskin offensive attack, the Burgundy and Gold defense also returned to its battle-wisened ways as it throttled down the Cardinal threat. In the fourth quarter, the Cardinals' 17 to 10 lead was given the acid test. In the first week, Roman Gabriel got four throws from the 10 yard line and failed. Last Sunday, Billy Kilmer got four throws himself. But the Cardinals once again turned back the threat as number 45, Jim Tolbert, intercepted the final toss to ensure victory number two for the surprisingly competitive St. Louis Cardinals. Pat, three weeks ago, I was really feeling sorry for the San Francisco 49ers. When they lost Steve Spurrier, I thought the outlook for 74 was gloomy as any in football. Now, Tom, though, they've pulled off two upsets in a row, the latest victims being the Atlanta Falcons. And if the 49ers keep coming up with this type of performance, who knows, they're liable to be favored one of these weeks. The sign said welcome, but considering the feelings that run between the Falcons and the 49ers, the sentiment was suspect. Immediately, helmets and bodies began to fly in what is one of pro football's more heated rivalries. Almost all of the important action took place in the first quarter, beginning with this interception by San Francisco linebacker Skip Vanderbunt, whose fumble was recovered close to Six Point City by a teammate. From there, number 19 Joe Reed scrambled a bit and then drilled Danny Abramowitz in the end zone and the underdog 49ers led 7-zip. For Abramowitz, it was one pass closer to the record of most consecutive games with a reception. The record now stands at 96 by Lance Allworth, but Danny is just three shy of that. The second time the Falcons had the ball, they were again intercepted. And then Joe Reed to number 40 Wilbur Jackson set up a one-yard 49er score as the lead bulged to 13 to nothing. For the Falcons, it was just one of those days when they should have stood in bed because even a great kickoff return by number 81, Gerald Taker, was about to be rendered useless. On the very next play, the 49ers took possession again on a fumble recovery by number 59, Willie Harper that threatened to turn the contest into a rout. But whatever disease the Falcons had turned out to be contagious, 
as Joe Reed's tipped pass fell like a wounded duck right into the arms of safety Ray Brown. And although Brown's return set up an eventual one-yard Atlanta score, the game soon reverted to its mistake-filled beginning. It was a day when both teams tried to give victory away numerous times. In the end, Atlanta tried harder and more often. And number 49, Ralph McGill, shut down the Falcons' last chance as San Francisco made it two upsets in a row, 16 to 10, to stay tied with the Rams atop the NFC West. Before the season began, there were many who felt the Los Angeles Rams had the potential to be the league's best, Tom. Huh? Well, I'm a believer now, Pat. And last week's showing against the New Orleans Saints was further evidence the Rams are just plain super. More than one NFL quarterback has felt the snap crackle and heard the pop of Los Angeles' new fearsome foursome. When New Orleans quarterback Archie Manning avoided the punishing pursuit, he was able to deliver one long gainer to number 88, Joel Parker. However, that was just about it, as the Los Angeles defense simply exploded in on Archie and the Saints. The Rams turned the Saints everywhere but loose, sacking Manning five times while running rough shot through the New Orleans offense. Offensively for the Rams, number 21, John Hadle, eased passes through the scattered Saints secondary for good game. 12. Twice, Hadle strikes, put points on the board. The first to big play receiver, Harold Jackson, number 29. 12. Hadle's second scoring volley went to Jack Snow as the Rams demolished New Orleans 24 to nothing. After a loss in week one to the Houston Oilers, the future of the San Diego Chargers wasn't exactly the brightest. After all, for the past two seasons, the Oilers have been saddled with the worst record in the NFL. And so, from facing one of the worst teams in week one to facing one of the best, the Bengals, for week two, Charger chances for improvement seem non-existent. It's always tough to beat the Bengals, and even more so in Riverfront Stadium. Last season, Cincinnati was unbeaten on their home turf, en route to a divisional playoff slot. But to the Chargers on this Sunday, all that was past history, and on their very first series, number 14, Dan Fouts directed San Diego in for the game's first score. Number 21, Glenn Bonner gave the Chargers the early lead while the San Diego defense helped to keep it. A Charles Anthony interception set up a second quarter field goal and a 10-0 Charger advantage. But behind the rabbit-like burst of Linville Elliott and number 26, Charlie Davis, the Bengal attack accelerated. Number 36, Linville Elliott, narrowed the Charger lead to three points, turning the ball back over to the poised second-year Charger quarterback, Dan Fouts. Fouts maneuvered his club inside the Bengal 10, only to have a sure score fizzle off the fingertips of wide receiver Jim Burns. Trailing 13 to seven in the third quarter, the Bengals sprung number 85, Isaac Curtis free for big yardage on the reverse. The 
The Bengals then went ahead as last year's AFC Rookie of the Year, Charles Booby Clark, number 42, banged in for the Bengals' first lead. With time running out in the fourth quarter, Dan Fouts found his club trailing 17-13. 98 yards separated the Chargers from victory. And it was now up to Fouts to deliver pinpoint shots to his receivers, who would be working the short routes underneath the Bengals' own defenses. Jim Burns' third down catch pumped new life into San Diego, and five plays later, Fouts had the Chargers ready to win it. After 97 yards, Fouts plunged the final distance as San Diego hung on to claim a hard-fought 20-17 win over a genuine NFL powerhouse, the Cincinnati Bengals. Every year, the Chiefs-Raider game in Oakland turns out to be quite an emotional affair. Uh, it's usually played later in the season, Pat, when big things are at stake. When it's Oakland and Kansas City, Tom, there are always big things at stake, even if it's preseason. Last week, the silver and black hit an emotional peak that would do credit to a team in a playoff game. As strange as it seemed, home plate was the place to cross when the Kansas City Chiefs rolled into Oakland's combination baseball-football stadium last week. Unfortunately for the Chiefs, it was the powerful Raiders who would do most of the plate crossing on this day. Ken Stabler and Fred Belitnikoff teamed up early on a 46-yard pass and go. And from there, the silver and black went. Stabler to rookie tight end Dave Casper resulted in a juggling touchdown of the typical Oakland miracle type. On defense, the Raiders went unmolested as 58 Monty Johnson swooped in as an agent of harassment all afternoon. The Chiefs' five and six man front challenged Stabler to pass, and Kenny consistently met the dare. This time on a thread the needle catch by number 49 Mike Ciani, who was a bit shaken up, but otherwise all right. Throughout the day, Raider Ballhawks were in full flight, and this time, number 26, Skip Thomas, pulled the ball down. Thomas, who had two steals for the day, drives a white Corvette with his nickname, Dr. Death, painted on the side. And last week, the doctor called on the Chiefs. One of his interceptions set up Pete Banizak's 20-yard scoring run, and the Raiders led 20 to nothing. Pete shows that although Banizak went right up the middle, he was virtually unscathed in his romp. Finally, the Chiefs got on the board when number 99, Wilbur Young, batted down a pass, caught it, and loped 52 yards to the end zone. Kansas City's slim hopes were short-lived, however, as potent Raider pressure triggered a faulty release by Mike Livingston, number 10. And Monty Johnson came up with a theft. Ken Staber and Dave Casper executed the finishing touch to make it a 27-7 Raider rampage and add a little more sparkle to the city of Oakland which now boasts first place football and baseball teams, as well as cheerleaders pretty enough to make it to the pages of Playboy magazine. Ah, to be in Oakland this fall. All of the Cleveland Browns cakewalked to victory over the Houston Oilers. The man who danced the most was an obscure 15th round draft choice from Widener College in Pennsylvania. His name? Billy White Shoes Johnson.
It was small wonder that Van Green was breathing fire. How could a 5'9", 160-pound rookie run circles around the veteran Cleveland Browns? Every time number 84, Billy Johnson, touched the ball, good things seemed to happen to the once hopeless Houston Oilers. Johnson's runbacks raise temperatures to the boiling point, but that is becoming standard procedure. In his senior year at college, he accounted for 2,500 yards in offense and scored a touchdown every seventh time he touched the football. Although Johnson's dazzling return set up many opportunities for the punchless Oilers, they capitalized only once on a scoring shot from Lynn Dickey to tight end Mac Alston, number 82. Alston's touchdown gave the Oilers a 7-3 lead. But from that moment on, Dickey rarely found a receiver wearing blue as three interceptions and two fumbles wiped out Houston hopes for an upset. Cleveland converted Houston errors into a 10-7 halftime lead on a field goal and a darting touchdown by exciting Greg Pruitt. Facing a very young, untested Oiler defense, quarterback Mike Phipps' attempt to score points in clusters was betrayed by his own receiving core. However, one receiver who has apparently blossomed is Steve Holden, a number one draft pick a year ago who caught one measly pass during the whole 1973 season. Holden's clutch receptions and some clever play action by Phipps spelled victory as the Cleveland Browns won their first of the year 20-7 over the young but surprisingly tough Houston Oilers. Now for the game that we were talking about earlier is the biggest story of the week, Tom. Well, Pat, this game was not only the biggest story of this week, but it will probably be remembered as long as pro football is played because it was the very first of its kind. John Ralston's Denver Broncos had lost on opening Sunday to an excellent Los Angeles Ram team, but only by one touchdown, and partly because they couldn't get it going until it was too late. Last week, against Chuck Knoll's excellent Pittsburgh Steeler team, John Ralston made sure that his team broke on top. A perfect onside kick on the opening kickoff gave Denver beautiful position, and Charlie Johnson's second pass of the day took the ball the rest of the way. Otis Armstrong's 45-yard touchdown gave the Broncos the early lead, and the most unusual game was off to a most auspicious beginning. Just one minute later, Jefferson Street, Joe Willie, Gilly Gilliam combined with Steve Davis, and the game looked even more unusual. Steve Davis 61 yard spectacular tied the score at seven. But on the next series, Dr. Johnson was at it again, this time to Haven Moses, number 25. The two good catches by Haven Moses made it Denver 14, Pittsburgh seven and the first quarter was barely half over. Just one minute later, and another big play for the Broncos. At 
the end of an amazing first quarter, Denver led 21 to 7. But in the second quarter, Joe Gilliam brought the Steelers back. And at the half, Denver's lead had been cut to 21 to 14. On the third play from scrimmage in the second half, many observers felt that Denver had lost the game. Charlie Johnson had not only been intercepted in Denver territory, but his shoulder had been injured, and he was forced to leave the game. Following the interception, Pittsburgh tied the score at 21, and then it was up to quarterback Steve Ramsey to get the Broncos moving again. Otis Armstrong got Denver close, and Ramsey hit tight end Riley Odoms in the end zone for the touchdown that put the Broncos back on top, 28 to 21. Once again, Joe Gilliam brought the Steelers right back, this time with a pass to rookie receiver John Stallworth. In all, Gilliam hit on 31 of 50 attempts for 348 yards. And although the next spectacular catch by Stallworth was not allowed, Gilliam and the Steelers tied the score at 28-28 at the end of three quarters. Two fourth quarter interceptions set up touchdowns for both teams. The last coming on a Steve Ramsey pass to Otis Armstrong, who rolled up 86 yards receiving and 131 rushing for the day. With the score tied at 35, Roy Girella had a chance to win it for Pittsburgh on the last play in regulation time. But his kick was blocked, and the NFL had its first regular season sudden death game. In overtime, Jim Turner's 41-yarder was inches wide. And as Coach Ralston said afterward, both teams played their hearts out. This game was destined to be a tie. Prediction time, and we're both red hot. Both two and one, Tom, but there's some tough games this week. How about the Jets at Buffalo? I'm going to pick the New York Jets to upset them at Buffalo. Okay, I'll go with the Bills. Cleveland at St. Louis. The Browns to finally knock the Cardinals off. I like the Cardinals. So Los Angeles at New England. Well, I think the Rams all the way, so they're going to be 3-0. and oh. I think they're probably the best team in pro football, so I'll pick them, too. Oakland at Pittsburgh. You know how I am about the Raiders. I'm going to go with the Raiders to beat Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah, I know how you are. I'll pick Pittsburgh. Okay. Monday night, Denver at Washington. Oh, the Redskins can't lose two in a row under Allen. I'll go with the Redskins. All right, I'll take Denver. Mm -hmm. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.